right, guys, what up? Uh, back for another episode of the Gospel Fire, and I am with the one and only creator of Fight to Win, my man Seth Daniels. What up, homie? I am good. How are you, Professor? I'm good, man. Where are you? Hawaii, right? Yeah, I'm in Honolulu. Honolulu, getting ready for that Fight to Win one hundo. Yep. Fuck, it was, it's cool that you're doing it in Hawaii, man. I love Hawaii. How's it, how's it treating you? <laughs> it's a cool spot, man. I mean, the weather's been a little shitty, but like... We're still trying to do some stuff, and you know I've been able to train every day I've been here, and everybody's super welcoming and super nice. So nice, nice man. Who's the Who's the main event for this one? Uh, my girl Tracy. Okay. Uh, Goodell is fighting Rita Gribben. We had a uh, we had Barrett Yoshida and Helen Gracie and a bunch of other stuff, and everybody got hurt, you know, and so it just made sense, you know. She was the 2018 Female Fighter of the Year and hometown girl, so. Man, I love how you include the girls, bro, and you put the girls to be main events. Um, it, it feels super, uh, super holistic too. It's not like something that you're forcing, and uh, like sometimes I feel like this like equal opportunity. People try to force it, and you could just you can just read right through it. It's it's just too obvious what they're doing, and you don't do it that way at all. You, you know, you do that really well. You, I think you did the first ever girls main event in jiu jitsu with Rozzy and Mackenzie Dern, right? Yeah, the way I feel about it. Like it doesn't matter, you know, like how old somebody is or what they're, you know, if they're boy or girl or whatever. If they're a draw and people want to see them, right? So it, it, what does it make a difference if they're the if they're the baddest motherfuckers on the card? Then why shouldn't they be the headliners? I I agree with you one hundred percent, bro. I agree with you one hundred percent. The best people should get the best spot, you know. That's why I think that's why you're always the main event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got you got me at number eight right now. How'd you do that, homie? You sent me that picture, and I was like, "What the fuck? What, what are you trolling me for? Would you would you copy and paste?" <laughs> no, man. No, I mean when we started, the flow started putting together the rankings. They let me start having input, right. and right. Um, they had Jared Dot ranked at number nine. And I was like, "Well, you're missing somebody right above him that just beat him." John so, John Combs too. John Combs too. You know, but not heavyweight. <laughs> Yeah, he'll get he'll get on there for he'll, sure. He'll get on there, these yeah. rankings, these rankings, we're really trying to push them this year to make them like a legit ranking system, like like the world ranking system. That's like what we're trying because they incorporate IBJJF, um, uh, um, ADCC, ADCC trials, and uh, fight to win and Kasai. Right. So that's, it's basically anybody that competes in any major organization does one of those. Sure. And so. A lot of it's based on how you place the tournaments, but with Fight to Win, it's just about head to head. It's my favorite thing about Fight to Win is it's 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 right now and it's one you and one guy. Um, it, it's cool, man. Like I, I really like what you've done. Like you moved away from the MMA scene. Um, why'd you do that? Because I hated it. <laughs> yeah, man, M- MMA sucks, right? I-, I I agree with you. I love my fighters, but MMA sucks. Why why do why do you fucking hate it? Well, that's the opposite. I hated the fighters. That was the main problem. I felt like I, I've said this a bunch of times in the past, but like when I feel like when a fighter, like an MMA fighter, come, walks into a gym, you know, they walk into elevation. They're like, "Hey, I got a fight. I need, you know, I need you to get me ready for my fight." Right? right but if somebody right. walks into a jiu-jitsu gym, they they say, "You know, I'd like to learn jiu-jitsu." There's just a different mentality of people when it comes to, you know, going out there and wanting to be a cage fighter versus wanting to learn a martial art. And I just enjoy working with people that are still trying to, you know, start at that level. It's not that I, I can say I hate all MMA fighters, but there are definitely a bunch of pieces of shit on my show that were just, they're so, you know, like, um, selfish and, and, and I just, I just couldn't take it anymore, man, to be honest with you. Plus, Plus I don't like the sport to be honest with you, man. Like, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things where I feel like the UFC is like completely overdone and I just got burned out, man. And it's like I always told myself whenever I if I ever start doing anything and strictly to make money, I have to stop. Fuck yeah, and man. I love that. Like I just talked to some people about that a second ago. They were like, would you do? they asked me if I would uh, like, you know, they're like, oh, you beat Vinny Magalash and he just was in the PFL final, you know, a million bucks, man. When you like you think you could be a millionaire? And I'm like, man, I, I, I'm, could I be a millionaire? Sure, but like, I don't do anything in my life for money. It fucking sucks. No, and if you, like, I feel like it, if you follow your passions and you work super hard, you can make the money anyways. But it's the sole focus of it, and that's where it got with me with the MMA and the concerts. It was like 
it was so stressful because those shows were like well over a hundred thousand dollars every single one. Right. And so it's like, fuck, I got to bring in, I got to bring in 30,000 in sponsorships and this and that and this and that. And these shows aren't cheap either, but it's still like, I don't know. It's just like a risk reward thing. You know, I feel like the people in jujitsu are a lot more grateful and gracious for, for being, for what we do for them as opposed to the MMA scene. It was just like, you know, they, they felt entitled. I totally understand what you're saying. Like we try not to have that with our MMA guys, you know, especially, uh, since we moved it back to Easton and, um, you know, Easton has a set of core values that we follow. And I believe that the MMA guys have to, if, if, if that's what we are doing, then they have to follow the same core values and it's really worked for us. You know, yeah, well, so you have a lot of great guys and I get, I get to train with them and a lot of them, you know, compete on my shows as well. For you sure, know, for sure. your team isn't every other team. So it's not really fair to compare, you know, one of the number one teams in the entire world to every other fucking jackass that I have to work with on a day to day basis. No, for sure. And that, that's where I was going. So, the, the MMA scene, you have these guys training, uh, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. They, they, they are not part of anything bigger than them. You know, and, yeah. and when it, when everything is, and when you're the biggest thing or the smartest one or, or the best, what you know, when, when that mentality starts to, to creep into your life, then yeah, you become very selfish and you start acting as a different way. You know, and I think we've all been there at parts in our lives and that can, that can go sideways. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, man, so you, uh, you, you haven't had the easiest path in life, Seth. You know, I, I don't even know that I know your whole story. Uh, but I know that it's, it's not the best, you know, you're, you're, you're beginning. I know you are sober now. Um, what, what is your story, man? I don't, I don't know it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I grew up in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma and, um, my, uh, my mom passed away when I was six years old and, uh, my dad kind of lost his shit. And so like, did, did, my your, whole- did your mom passing away? Is that what caused your dad to lose his shit? Uh, I think he probably, I think she was like the glue that kept him together Okay. from what, I, from what I've been told, you know, but like she passed away when I was six of uh, breast cancer and he, um, he just kind of went off the deep end and he's kind of like, uh, dude's kind of like bipolar and, and like, uh, manic. So like my childhood was pretty rough. Like, you know, we would, we, he was my judo coach too. So that was pretty rough. So like growing up, all I did was judo and 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 train in school, you know. And it was like so you stayed with your dad, even though he had lost he he'd gone off the rails, but you, en- enough to be able to stay with you. I guess, man. I mean, that's what social services and the police said. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, we, just, we got the shit beat out of us like all the time growing up as kids, you know. So like, I got the, I had to create this like tough exterior, you know, to deal with like getting beaten on as a kid and. You know, it was pretty mentally fucked up, like, in, until I was about 13. And then we moved to uh, Houston, Texas, and I got part of a, a new gym. And that's actually when I started doing jiu-jitsu as well, when I was 13. And um, started doing, you know, we were mixing judo in with our jiu-jitsu, and my dad was no longer my coach. So things got a whole lot better for me at that point, you know? For sure, and, for sure. You know, and so we just, you know, I won, I won 10 national titles in, in judo as a kid. And then, um, uh, I won the high school state wrestling championship when I was like 18. And, um, you know, I, I mean, everything was going pretty good. You know, I was still having some mental issues, um, being able to control myself on the, on and off the mats. Like depression or anger? Anger. Anger. Okay. Really bad. Were you getting like, in trouble? Um, I didn't get in trouble like in school and shit like that, but like, you know, I was like banned for two years in judo because (laughs) (laughs) at the junior international championship when I was 18, you remember Manny Gambarian? Uh Uh-huh. So me and Manny were like rivals coming up for the junior worlds. And, um, I did this move that was considered illegal for that tournament for some reason. I still don't know why, but anyways, I did it. They disqualified me, which for that match, which gave Manny a spot in the finals, which guaranteed he got to take away my spot on the junior world team. So I lost my shit and I attacked the referee and <laughs> I fucking dropped him. So like you, like you punched him? Yeah. And so I went I go after the referee. Yo, let me ask you a question. I got a I got a 
cut in real fast. What is with these judo referees when someone like, I don't know, I've watched like three judo matches where, where people get put to sleep, where the referee just stands there and looks at them like they're dead. Yeah, that's what they do. They're not <laughs> supposed to touch the competitors. It's fucking weird. It's funny though. Yeah, it's weird, man. They just stand over them and look at them. They don't touch them. They don't help them. They just yeah, look sure. at them like they're a dead person. Well, that's one of the biggest problems in judo is the referees because most of them didn't compete. They got into the sport later and they're too old to compete, but they want to be involved, which is great. You know what I mean? But at the same time, like you don't know what the fuck these guys are going through. And they have like this bureaucratic, you know, this, this like power complex with their mustaches and their stupid fucking pants. And then they sit there and fucking they, they're just so disconnected from the athlete. It's like it's so different than jujitsu. Like, completely different. Sure, sure. All right, so go back. You punched the fucking referee. Punched, dude. And uh, so I got kicked out, but it, like, really fucked up my whole life because I had a scholarship. <laughs> I had a scholarship at the Olympic Training Center and um, free room and board and all that. And so I lost all that. And so when I moved to Colorado, like, I was under the pretenses. Like, I was going to get a live, stay, and go to college for free. And then I got up there, and they were like, no, man, you can't stay you're here. Fucking bro. Gone. Like, you're fucking gone. Get the fuck out. You're fucking out. You know, so I was like, fuck me. So I had to I, – I was still I, – I made – I got into the college, and so I had like six months. My first six months was already covered. It was free because I was on a full ride. So I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just, I'll, I'll just work, you know, at 24-Hour Fitness, and I'll – you know, I'll, I'll just make money and pay for my college. And then after like three months, I was like, fuck this college bullshit. I'm just going to go make money. And then uh, and then I quit judo and just pretty much worked for the next, you know, six years and partied and, you know, just did a bunch of drugs and hooked up with sluts. And fucking like after, you know, six years, I ran into Mike Nichols and, and Josh Ford and they, uh, you know, it's like one of those things, you know, when you meet that guy, like say you're at a restaurant, you go to like a taco place and he's like, yeah, man, like I was a badass in high school and I did this and I did that. What's the first thing we do? We invite him into our gym. Of course. Right? Oh yeah. That's what we do. Number so one. I was getting tattooed by Josh talking about, you know, how awesome I was at judo. And what year is this? 2005. Okay. You know, talking about how awesome I was at judo. So obviously I get the invite. And you how, know? how old are you in 2005? 25. Okay. So you and I are the same age, 1980. 20, uh, 81. 81. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're a millennial and I'm not. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, <laughs> go. I don't know how that works. I believe <laughs> that actually. So they invite me down to the gym, you know, and I'm just like, you know, whatever. You know, I'm like, I, I'm going to go down here and fuck everybody up, you know. Dave, I'm Dave, Dave Ruiz's spot, right? Colorado Dave, BJJ. Yep. Dave Ruiz's spot. Yep. And the first day, my first role was Robert Wonderlic. Okay. And then I had Angela Swimmer and Matt Cram and Big Mike. And so, like, I don't know these guys at all. So I hit, like, I hit an inverted triangle or, or, or my reverse triangle on a uh, Matt Cram. And I choked out Angelo. And then Robert and Big Mike just beat the shit out of me. And I remember like afterwards, I wasn't like, fuck that, you know, I was like, I remember just like sitting in my car because I was so, like, I had tons of money back then, you know, so like I, I remember I had like an Escalade with like 26 inch spinners and like all this stupid shit. I remember being in my car in, in, in the parking lot afterwards and just being like, what the fuck have I been doing the past five years? You know, just dicking around, just dicking no. around, what doing drugs, fuck? right? this money and girls and fucking working 120 hours a week like what though it was like instant i was like i gotta get my ass back and shit because i was like 240 back then too you know because i was taking a bunch of steroids and so like <laughs> you're I was, a fucking man bro uh, yeah so <laughs> i got i was so sore though that i couldn't go back to the class for another week because my body hurt so bad because i hadn't done anything like that you know mm -hmm. and then um i went back and then and you know how it goes from there you know and then i remember like one thing that was a major change for me when I was a, I was a white belt, I was like a three stripe white belt. And I remember the night before I went out and I was doing ecstasy and I hooked up with this girl and I remember coming in to the gym, like rolling and like just smelling like straight up whore and fucking Dave was like, bro, you can't train today. And I was like, no, no, I'm good. He's like, fine, whatever. And so I like put my gi on and all that, and all the upper belts just beat the fuck out of me. These are and that, these are the old days of jujitsu. 
<laughs> that was the last time I went to jujitsu rolling on ecstasy. Nice. And, nice. Um, and then like I quit and then I, I used to smoke so much weed, you know, and it was like, I was hitting at least like fucking an eighth every other day just by myself, you know? And it's just like, I got, I was like, man, I got to get my wins, got to get better. You know, I was like, I got, I got to, I got to get healthier. And it was just that, that trend that just kept, kept happening where it was just like wanting to better your life one step at a time. But my push for it was doing jujitsu. It's amazing that jujitsu does that to so many people. Yeah. Like just, just the, the first time they step on the mat and something happens to them and they're like, God damn, like, what is it? Because you got fucked up and that's everyone's experience. It's not like you come in and you beat people's ass. Like it, it's the other way around. And yeah. for some reason you're like, I, I need that again. You know, it, it's like the greatest drug in the world. Yeah. And then, you know, I, it was hard. It was back then, you know how it was for all of us, you know, it was all the cool guys were at TSKOs. You know, mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of that. So I was like, all right. So I started, I, I, I went from, you know, I'm working 120 hours a week at 24 hour fitness. I'm the vice president of the company versus I'm a white belt. As my rank starts going up, my hours start going down. And eventually I could give a fuck about how much money I'm making, you know, and eventually I get demoted <laughs> once, twice, three times because I just don't care anymore. Right. right you know, because right, right. it's just like, it's just not me. <clears throat> I'm. I'm not meant to sit behind a desk and call people and sell people shit that they don't need, you know? And, um, and so like over time, it just like, it became everything, it became a whole life and then tried MMA fighting and it was fucking terrible. And, uh, that was a hard, that's one of the things though about like, I, I had a lot of problem with fighters, but I, I respect everybody that goes in there and does it because it's fucking hard and it's horrifying. People it's, don't realize that, you know, it's like, the you know, scariest like, yeah, fucking thing yeah. in the world. Cause I never got in fist fights. The only fist fights I ever got in a kid was with my dad and he's six foot two and 300 pounds. That shit was very one sided when you're a nine year old. <laughs> and so like I get in there and I seriously, I've never been in a fist fight. My first fight ever was at ring of fire against Jesse Henley. And I remember just being like, they closed the doors and they're like fight. And my hands did not move. I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? Here? What am I doing? And dude was just like hitting me and I just couldn't do anything. I was just like completely stunned. You know, you were on that car too. I think you were the main event. It was the one that Shane Carwin was on and Michelle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rob McDonald beat me up at that one. Um, yeah. That yeah. Was I just car. did a podcast with Rob. Rob and I are friends again. Now we've like reconnected. Um, He's a good guy. Yeah. And then, you, you know, so you should get him on a fight to win. He wants to fight someone good. I remember, I remember backstage, Brad Fox was like trying to get me to calm down. Like before the fight. b rap yeah, Fuck and yeah. Then, like telling me a bunch of horrible jokes. And I remember <laughs> him like, dude, like, I don't want to be here. Yeah. Like backstage, I was like, I don't want to do this. That's how He's Cowboy like, used to be. He's still kind of yeah. like that a little bit. I can remember my second or third fight, you know, when, when yeah, you're, you're still really scared shitless, you know? Yeah. And like Cowboy comes up to me, we're backstage, and he's like, hey, man, let's go. And I'm like, what? He's like, let's leave. He's like, why, <laughs> why are we doing this? Like, I was like... What you want? You want to go? And like, it sounds like a good idea when you're in the middle of it, right? You're like, yeah. fuck yeah, you you, you want to go too? You know? <laughs> and like, I was like, hey, I went, I remember walking up to Tyler Toner and being like, yo, bro, you got to get Cowboy away from me, or he is gonna talk me into leaving right now. <laughs> well, and, and it's one of those things too. It's just like the anxiety and the pressure and all that stuff. It was just so much. So I never had fun doing it. I just, even the training, this, I was so stressed out about the upcoming fight. I couldn't even enjoy getting better. I think that's why I was a blue belt for four years was because like, I just like, I never got any better. I just got tougher. It's and a, then it's a big I, problem that happens in MMA though, man, is, is you don't improve. Nobody. Yeah, improves. I never you know, because all they're, they're only worried about this next fight. So when you're worried about this next fight that you have, you in, in your mind, you can't lose a round. You can't lose a minute of a round. So rather than like lose a little bit to be like, okay, I need to work on this and, and, and move forward. You have this like, I can't lose, I can't lose, I can't lose, I can't lose. So therefore, you don't work on anything and then you show up fight to fight with the same exact tools. You, you're, you're no better than what you were uh, a month ago, two months ago, and six months ago. Because you're just so engulfed in the in the stress of not losing. Yeah, and it was it just crushed me like mentally, you know. And then I mean, I only did four of them, and then at the end of my last one, I got fucked up really bad. Like I, I broke my jaw and my I was nose. There, I remember it, just, it hurt so bad. And I remember being backstage with Oscar and Dave, and I was like, I don't ever want to fucking do this again. Yeah. Ever. And Oscar was like, Thank 
God. <laughs> they had my back. They had my back, dude. You know, they were like, you want to do this? We're with you 100%, whatever you need. But like you could tell that like afterwards they were just like, thank God this is over. Yeah. You know, and it was it was like a huge sigh of relief. I felt like I lost a thousand pounds, like the same way it was when I quit promoting MMA, you know, and then and then at that point, I remember meeting with Sven like two days afterwards. And and uh, the reason I started doing the MMA fights was because Keith had done some shady shit to me before that last fight. Schmelzer. <laughs> Yeah, I was supposed to fight this dude that was 0 and 1, and I was like 1 and 1 at the time. And he switched it at the last minute at literally out weigh-ins after I lost 30 pounds to a title fight against a guy that was 7 and 0 named Sam Farrell. Yeah, this was this was at Red and Jerry's, right? And I remember being like, dude, like, you know, Oscar's like, fuck that, and I was like, bro, I lost 30 pounds. Like I'm doing this, you know, and I just got this shit beat out of me, and I was like, I know I can do better than this. I know I can. I can treat people better than this and I, I can do a better job than this. And then, you know, the thing with the tournaments, I just started the jujitsu tournaments just because I didn't have enough money to put on an MMA show. So my whole thought process was like, all right, you, I had 2000 bucks, right? So I was like, you got $2,000. I bought like uh, 400 t-shirts and I sold those at the MMA shows for a few months leading up to it, it made like a cut another two grand. So I had like 4,000 bucks, which was enough to run the first tournament. But it wasn't enough to do an MMA show. So I made like a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars on the tournament. I had like six thousand dollars. Still wasn't enough. So I did one more tournament and we did really good, made like twelve thousand. Now I had eighteen thousand dollars that I had because I I'd lost my job too from 24 hour fitness at this time. So it was like I was like all in on a business that was just an idea. And so I had like 18 grand, I had enough to put on an MMA show. And then after the first MMA show, I was like, man, I, I really like doing tournaments more than I like doing the MMA shows. Like that was way more fun. And then we just started, you know, bouncing back and forth between them, you know, but, um, you know, I mean, it, it really, the jujitsu just getting in there really changed me and it, it changed my whole outlook on life. Is that when you got sober? No, I, um, you know, over those next five years when we were doing all the MMA shows and, I was producing the MMA shows for HDNet and um, doing the tournaments in Texas and Colorado and all that. Um, you know, we traveled a bunch, and um, I would. The road's not good, right? The road is road's, tough for drugs, man. The road's tough, and it wasn't. I wasn't. I, I wouldn't really consider myself an addict. Um, you know, I didn't have to go through the twelve steps like my wife did or anything like that. Um, you know, but I, I. I she was in a different scene, right? She was in like the club scene. She was a fucking badass DJ, right? Right, yeah. So she was like really into coke and drinking and stuff like that. Like I was just into partying. Okay. So like I didn't like sit at home and drink or sit at home and do drugs. Like I would just like go out while I was married to my ex-wife, go out, go to go to the after parties of the show, bang the ring girls, and then fucking go home and act like nothing happened. And normally like I'm not like that normally as a person but when you start mixing in you know drugs and drinking like you're all the fucks start going away that and the care. fight life man and the fight it's just, life it's yeah. just how it was and i just got tired of myself to be honest with you you know i cheated i probably cheated like a thousand times and i was just like man this is fucking stupid like what am i doing and so we wound up splitting up when i was 30 and then um uh you know i got with lauren pretty soon after that and it's, that's actually a pretty funny story because the first time we started talking and I went to hang out with her in California for one of her fights. And she was like, well, I just want to let you know I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, cool, this bitch likes to party, you know? So like, I didn't really understand, like she was like a seven year sober alcoholic. And so, the, <laughs> <laughs> so like the first night we went out, like I got completely shit faced. Right. And I was like, you know, like trying to make out with her in the bar and like all. And it was just like, can you imagine that? Like as somebody that you're talking to and you're completely sober. You guys you are know? just on different planets, man. She's like, I'm an oh. alcoholic. Like I'm not drinking anymore. And you're like, you're an alcoholic. Fuck. Yes. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that, that I still don't know why she stuck with me after that first day, but it was, it's a, it's a pretty funny, if I could have had a fucking GoPro on me that weekend, and then like two days later during that vacation, she's like, hey, I'm going to go to a meeting. You want to go with me? And I went with her and I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, shit. You're this, this kind of alcoholic. Way, All right. Yeah, this, this is way different than what I was thinking. But so like after that, you know, I really wanted to be with her and I realized how important it was to her not to uh, not to drink and all that. So I just quit. That's why I quit. 
So I just quit drinking and quit doing everything else and just started, you know, living, you know, fucking really straight and putting all my time and energy into growing this business and, and doing jujitsu. Fuck yeah, man. It seems like, like, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to ask you, but like, uh, from an outsider's perspective, like, I don't know your relationship with your ex-wife, but I see you around that all the stuff with your kids and stuff that you guys have together. It seems like you guys have been able to at least make peace there to, to be around at the same time for the kids. We both had to have it. We both had our own demons, you know, but I mean, in the end, in the end, it's not like we're, you know, best friends or whatever, but sure. you know, we're friends and, you know, we, you can't just, you, if you, if you're going to co-parent with somebody, you, you can't talk shit about the other parent, especially not to the kids. Right. Right. And, and you can't, you know, you, you have to be able to compromise and you have to be able to give and you have to be able to deal with, you have to, if you love your kids, if you're just a piece of shit, then you can do whatever you want and not talk to your kids. But we we're 50, 50 parents. So, I mean, there's really no, I don't see, I don't understand how people can do that. Like, I don't understand how you could have kids with somebody and co-parent with them and then hate each other. It doesn't like, work. There's, it doesn't. It's, yeah. it's impossible. It's impossible. Like, it's impossible for your kids to have a normal life. And me having such a fucked up childhood, it's super important to me that my kids not have a normal life but have an extraordinary life and you, <laughs> you have your one son carter right who just smashes i get he's a stud athlete right yeah carter is a uh he's 12 year old he's i mean it's my opinion but i think he's the best defensive football player for his age group in the state fuck yeah and he's I, pretty so decent running back but incredible middle linebacker decent point guard in basketball um, but he, he, he used to do like five sports and now he's just really wants to focus on football and basketball, which I'm totally, totally cool with, you know, sure, sure. And my, my 10 year old Gabe is a gray belt over at Easton and they're just, they're completely different people. You know, it's like my, my, my oldest is a stud. He's, you know, five foot three, 120 pounds with an eight pack, like gets hit up on Instagram by like a million different girls. <laughs> and my 10 year old is like a sweet little chunky baby. Oh, like that's funny. It, it's com- they're completely different human beings, you Man, know. I had a I had a crazy like it was kind of cool for me this weekend. I had uh, Simon, my youngest, um, played in his first like organized game basketball. He's five years old, but he's been competing with his brother at sports and everything basically since since he could get up and walk. And and my oldest is like he's a sweetheart of a kid, but like he he loves sports and he likes competing. So like I don't know that Simon's ever won anything. You know, like, like ever. So I guess that's kind of made him a little nervous, but he's also very athletic because of it compared to like, he's probably as fast as my oldest, you know, and they're three and a half years apart. So Simon played in his first game this weekend and you know, they're five years old. They're five year olds, right? So most five year olds can barely run. Right. And you know, for, for sure they can't fucking dribble and you know, shooting, that'd be another, that, that'd be difficult too. But Simon's been trying to keep up with Kanan and Kanan makes him play on a 10 foot hoop, which is really hard for him because Kanan doesn't give a fucking inch. And man, this hoop, this hoop was six feet tall and my, and Simon could run, he can run and dribble, you know, both at the same time. Holy fuck. He was a rock star. And like the coolest part was his brother was Kanan was like cheering him on. He's like, yeah, Simon. Yeah. You're the man, Simon. You're the man, buddy. He's like telling him to run back. He's like, you know how when like after like in the NBA, after they, after they know they made the shot, they just walk back with their hand up in the air. He's like, keep your hand up in the air, Simon. Keep it up. You want to know why? You're the man, Simon. It went in like, like the, how much his brother loved him. It made me so happy, you know, like, but he's only good because of his brother and you know it was hilarious man it was and simon was like oh yeah i'm the man (laughs) well i mean i think one of the things too is important to me like because that that competition was happening with my kids too right when they're coming up but i mean it's like it's such different worlds between the two kids just like their body styles you know right and so like it's really important to me that they don't play the same sports gotcha you know and so it's like you know Gabe is playing basketball, but like rec basketball, and then Carter plays on a 14 year old gold crown team and he's 12. Sure. You know, sure. it's like it's a different world, you know, and it, you know, people always say like you're supposed to treat your kids the same, but you can't. You can't. No, no, no. You have different children. Each, each kid has to be treated completely. And my, my five year old, like, he has shown like zero interest in doing sports. Like, he does gymnastics right now. I don't fucking care. Like, I, he, one of the best things I think about, at least, you know, with jujitsu for me and well, I'd say for football and basketball is I, I was horrible at those sports. Like I was 88 pounds when I was 14 years old. So I was not the man in school. So, you know, I don't coach him. 
in any way, shape or form. The only stuff I know about football is what I learned from Madden, you know? And so <laughs> like, I, 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 I hire coaches for him. Like he has a linebacker coach. We just strength and conditioning at Landau's, um, you know, and, but I don't interfere at all with any of his stuff for basketball. When we go play basketball together, like I just rebound for him and pass the ball to him. Yeah. That's literally what I You're do. his dad. You're not his coach. I'll play him one on one and he'll just smash me. He's better than me. He beats me, right. you know, but but with my with my son and it's really helpful. And I think this is an important thing. You know, if you're training jujitsu or your kid trains jujitsu, um, you have to be able even if you're a black belt yourself, you're not necessarily a black belt instructor. And so, you know, when it comes to my 10 year old, Jamin is his coach. And Jamin, you know, is a 130 pound purple belt that I can beat with both hands tied behind my back. But I can't coach a child like in any way, shape or form. And it's so nice to know that you can leave your kid at a school or at a football practice or whatever and know that they're completely taken care of and they're going to get the best instruction possible. You don't have to jump in and be involved. Yeah. <laughs> Cause the, if that, your kid winds up hating their coach, you know, cause that, that was one of the things that I think hurt my relationship with my dad growing up was, you know, if my coach was being a dick to me, I had no one I could talk to. It started at practice continued in the car and all the way to the house at dinner before bed at the shower. Yeah. yeah it doesn't leave. It, it, it never goes away, you know? And so I, I'm just not a huge fan of coaching your own children in anything. And I'm, you know, luckily to be part of a gym, especially in jujitsu that, you know, has amazing coaches. I do, you know, I do coach my kids. Uh, well, Canaan, I do because I teach the classes twice a week. Um, but we leave it, I leave it there. You know, when, a, when we come home, if he wants to do jujitsu at home, it's all play. Like yeah. all, all it is is play. Like we are not like we are not drilling arm bars in the basement, you know, like jujitsu is for jujitsu. If, if he wants to do more and Simon wants to do more, well, then, of course, we go do more. But we play like there's yeah. no like I'm there. Like, yes, in that two or three hours a week that we're, we're at jujitsu. Sure. It's yes, sir. We're on the mat like like any other coach should be. But once once we leave that, I mean, I don't care if he was terrible at jujitsu, um, as long as he wasn't disrespectful to anybody, right? But if he had a terrible day, I mean, we're we're back to like in my opinion, it's back to, all right, man, how was school? How was how was basketball? How was football at school? How was how was the you know like what what you do? You, know? you have balance, and you probably had a good father growing up that taught you that. I had the best you know? dad, yeah. I, I have to. Dad. I have to go completely based on what I would have wanted as a child. Right. So I have to be the parent that I wanted growing up, not the one that I had. So like that's how I have to look because I didn't have, I didn't have a template to go off of. I had a negative template. Sure. So I can just build off the opposite of whatever he did. You know. But that works too, right? Sometimes, like uh, you know, when when people are defining what they want in their lives, you can. I think sometimes it's easier to define what you don't want. Because you know exactly what you don't want sometimes. So when you start there by, by the process of elimination, you can get down to what it is that you actually want. So, you know, there are yeah. two ways to go about it. You know, you can, you can get to Denver from Boulder a bunch of different ways. No, it makes, it makes a ton of sense. But no, man, the, kid, the kids are great and it's, it's fun. And, it, you know, at that 10 to 12 year old, like it's getting exciting now, especially with, with Carter. It's like we got to pick which high school. Are you going to play at Valor? Are you going to play at Creek? Like, you know, we have, we have, you know, different interests and, and offers to be able to get, you know, free pu private schooling. And it, it's cool, man. It's going to be fun. It's going to be nice. fun next year, you know, until he leaves. Hell yeah, man. Fuck yeah. Um, but let's, let's get back to this pro jujitsu thing. Cause I think you're the starter of it. All right. You know, no, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. I would say that. I would say that Halleck. Uh, Metamorphs. You're right. Halleck but he was so shady, you know, yeah. he was so he shady. Met him though, dude. What's that? Have you ever met him? I've met Halleck a bunch, yeah. He yeah. is not a shady person. He's fucking weird, dude. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not like that dude was like the guy from Fire Festival, right? <laughs> like he he did not try to embezzle money. He didn't try to do he had a really good idea and he had really good intentions and he had really bad execution. True. You know? But I mean like I you know, I've done a lot of interviews because I'm friend me and him are friends. And so like, you know, people were like when I first started, I shit on him a bunch because I had to, because that's, you know, how I got this going was talking about actually paying people and doing what you say you're going to do. But I didn't know him at the time. After I'd met him, my opinion on him completely changed because I thought he was just like this scam artist trying to rip people off. And then I realized he's just a fucking idiot. Uh, OK, I wouldn't say that. I, I knew that. I knew he was. I knew he was just uh, in over his head. 
Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't know that when I went, went before I met him. You know, before I met him, I was just like, oh, this guy. But he created a really cool concept, and you know, he. Um, it was you know the, the production was decent. It was like a you know LFA or something like that, and it was it was cool. You had the best guys in the world out there competing, and um, I remember watching the Eddie Bravo versus Hoyler two, uh-huh, and uh-huh. I loved you know I loved it. And then afterwards, when Gracie Mag wrote that horrible article and like only featured pictures that looked like Hoyler was winning the match. <laughs> and then Eddie was like, you know what? Fuck you. I'm doing my own thing. Right. And then Eddie created the EBI and it was a tournament format. And I was like, you know, this, this what they're doing is not sustainable. I was like, you got, you got fucking 16 guys and two of them are from the city that they're fighting in. And then this one, you've got all these expensive ass athletes and they're not from the city. So you're completely counting on hardcore pay, pay-per-view, hard yeah, pay-per-view. To to and I was like, I need to convert this to where I can do regional shows like I do my MMA shows, bring in top level talent for the last two, fill the undercar with locals and not focus on the internet and focus on telling selling tickets. And maybe the internet comes later. So I just took what they were doing wrong, in my opinion, and did it my way. And this was like right after I did um, my second to last MMA show. I remember telling – I bought all that concert equipment and I told my wife, I was like, I hate doing concerts and I hate promoting MMA fights. She's like, well, you spent a quarter million dollars and we have nothing left. So (laughs) I was like, I don't know. The only thing I like doing is I like jujitsu and I enjoy – throwing the party. She was like, well, just throw parties for jujitsu. And I was like, I don't know if people will come. And she was like, well, make it exciting somehow, you know, cause in, in general, I think in my opinion, jujitsu is a very boring sport to watch as a spectator, like traditional jujitsu, yes. you know, like watching an IBJJF matches. It's like, I'd rather fucking watch two flies fuck on a wall. And so I'm watching, I'm watching it and I'm watching Meta Morris and then I, I, I watch ADCC and I start pulling what I like from each rule set, you know? And so I was just like, you know, I think what, what we're going to do is just take away all the rules and just let people do whatever they want and only do submission only, which I was not a fan of for my regular tournaments at all. And so well, it's, hard to, it's, hard, it's hard to get definite winners, right? It's hard to get, it is hard to get definite winners, but it opens up the game. Oh, I like, I, I love your rule set. I'm yeah. a, I'm a huge fan. People, you know, it allows you to be creative and it allows you to take risks that you would not take in normal competition. Mm-hmm. I trained with a guy yesterday that owns the Kakoa Collective in Hawaii, Aubrey, mm-hmm. and it was a super frustrating. We trained three rounds and the first round he sat in my half guard and just like an anvil on my chest, like didn't really try to pass just like was just there. And I was Stupid. just like, open up. I just let go of my legs. And yeah. Just like, pass and pass, then got yeah. And just I, don't, I don't even foot. fight the pass, bro. Like, Neither do I. It's, but, it, you know, it's because I'm too old, personally. Yeah. Like, I, I can invert one time. Like, I can, like, invert one time and, and if you deal with that one invert, well, fuck it. I'm escaping yeah. side control. Yeah, good for you. So he, <laughs> you know? He, yeah. He, so, and then the second time we go, I was like, alright, I'm gonna get on top this time. And then it was like, it opened up a little bit. And then the third time I was like, I'm just going to stand up. And so I like stood up and I just played open. I just fucking murdered him. Yeah. And it was just one of those things where it's like when you can open up your game, you know, and you're not so stuck, you know, I feel like it, creativity comes. And so w- we did the first one and I, you weren't a part of that first one. No, I, I was in, that. I was in uh, Mexico city. I remember watching it on the internet. And I remember like doing it and I remember thinking like, I got to be able to make it look cool. So we did a little bit of stuff and then the second one and then we started picking up and then I, you know, I, I went in and I spent like a hundred grand on the sixth one. But the, the scary thing was traveling out of state and doing all that. And it was really hard. You know, Andre Gaval, you know, was a huge part of us being able to um, expand. Just that he did it. Well, because the first, when I when the first four shows, I don't count. Like people always ask me like when Fight to Win started, it really started at show five. Because the first four shows, it was Denver and Texas. Right. Like, Denver, Texas, Denver, I, Texas, right? I've been doing all of my events there for 12 years. Of course, they're going to be successful, the first one, you sure. know? 
Like people are going to support, you know, whatever. But San Diego, I knew nobody. So right. I'm going out there and I announce it and 53 people applied for the show. And, and that's like from all over California, like 12 people from San Diego applied to be on the show. And I'm like, fuck, fuck this doesn't work. Like it, it only works in these two markets. I can't do it. And I remember being like, what do I do? And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking reach out to Andre and have him help me. And I was like, dude, I need more guys. Cause I knew Andre because I booked Angelica originally to fight Rosie. Right. And she got hurt and I prepaid her. He made me prepay her show money up front <laughs> because he didn't know, you know, it was like, he thought right. it was like Meta Morris thing. So sure, I, paid sure. her, I paid her her show money up front, sent her a check. And then she got hurt. And I told him, I was like, nah, man, just keep the money and help pay for her PT or whatever. You know, she was mm -hmm. training for fight on my show. It's cool. You know? And so he kind of, I felt like I didn't feel like he owed me one. He felt like he owed me one. And so when I reached out to him, I was like, can you get some of your guys to apply, dude? Like I, I want to do the show. And, and then like, after like a couple of days of him sending me names, I was like, you know, how much would it take for you to fight on the show? And he gave me a pretty high number. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's do it. And as soon as I signed him, like people were like, oh, this is legit. Sure. Like he signed Galval and Galval is like on the internet saying like, I'm the main event on this show. You guys need to support this event. And then I signed Barrett and then everything opened up after that. And then the San Francisco show was our, was like our big break. That was like our big one. We sold 3000 tickets to it. And like, it was, it was just, it was a huge event, biggest event we ever had. And it was like, you know, flow covered it. And it was just, it, it really showcased because we had like about half of the production we have now, but we had it back then. And it was so much further than anybody had ever taken lighting and sound and video for jujitsu. And in that market, like it's such a big market that people were just like blown away by it. And the word just spread all over the country. Yeah, man, you know? I, I fucking love competing in fight to win. It's my favorite thing to compete in right now, you know? Well, the way, I, the way I look at it is, like, I feel like what we've done is we've created, Big Mike was saying this too, like, we've created a fight mentality to where I'm training for, like, an MMA fight, but I'm not doing an MMA fight. Mm -hmm. Like, I've teammates getting me ready. I've got posters. I've got flyers. I've got promo videos. I'm becoming, I'm 43 years old over here, becoming in a, a star athlete. I have fans. I'm making money doing something that is not that stressful. Yeah. It, you know, and, and like, I don't have to get in that great a shape to do it. Like people, <laughs> people normally compete at their, at their normal weight. Like people don't drop a ton. I drop a lot of weight when I fight, but that's just cause I get so fat, you know? And so like, but most sure, people like the top guys do, like you said, the main event guys in the co-main event. Yeah, sure. Those guys are serious. You know, yeah. but but the rest well, of the card. I feel, like every, I feel like everybody's serious. Like everybody, like even in the gym, you can sense it. Like yeah, what like, I'm saying by serious is like they're serious competitors traveling the world and the country trying to fight, you know, right. and trying to build their name. Everyone else like is going to do this event that's that's serious to them and cool, and it like it like puts the pressure on them, which is which is really cool. I think I think people need that in their life. When I, I think it's also I think I think when we did this and we created this you know this structure and this ability to create these, as I always say, I'm trying to create these lasting memories for these people. Like sometimes you get a 50 year old, I have 50 year old, 60 year old guys that compete on the show. Their grandchildren get to watch them do this. They will never forget that. Uh huh. They yeah, they, they, their grandkids can, walk out and like they see their grandpa walk out. It's, it's cool, man. Fuck yeah. It, it, it's, it's amazing. And you can't do that in MMA. No. And no. so we give these, we give parents and kids and everybody a chance to be a rock star you know, even if it's just for a couple of minutes and then if they're good and they hustle and they keep coming back and they build a brand for themselves, like look at Isaiah, you know, yeah. you go from yeah. barely doing anything competing and now you're ranked number eight in the world. Yeah. That's, but that stuff helps when it comes to seminars. That stuff helps when it comes to people coming in and joining your gym. It's all virality. And with, with everything being so social right now, it's I've, like the same thing I, I tell everybody at the shows is like, you do not need to worry about how cool this show is going to look and feel. Every single one of your people that come in here tomorrow is going to know where every single dollar that they spent went. Yeah. And they're going to have a great fucking time and they're going to get drunk and they're going to bang on the mat and they're going to love it. And my me, kids love it. My kids love coming. You know, like my, my wife hates jujitsu tournaments. She, she, she sat in so many arenas with me. Can't stand it. Like I hate to win. Too when I put them on, dude, yeah. I hate 
jiu-jitsu yeah, tournaments. Yeah, likes fight to win, man. Likes the fight to win. The only reason I even do jiu-jitsu jiu tournaments and the only reason I even do them in Colorado is so I can see all my friends from all the other schools. I hate putting them on. Yeah, but it's, it's good for the community too, man. You know? No, it's, it's it good is. For it the is. Community. And I know I run a good event and everybody likes it, but that's why I only do them in Denver. But the, what I tell the fighters about the production is like, look, I'm going to hold up my end. Your end is to let everything go. Forget the stress. Forget the anxiety. Have a good time. Have fun when you're out there. Walk out there. Do all your best shit. And if I do my job and you do your job, those people that are in the crowd that bought tickets to see the event that might not necessarily be training jujitsu are going to share pictures or share videos. And then they're going to want to come in and start training at your gym. You are going to change their life personally by the way that you compete tomorrow. Yeah, it's, and, it's, that, and that's how I feel. That's what I feel like we're doing. And everywhere I go, I see it. I see people posting that we're at the show and then they go and start and they join. Even if I only get five people per market, that's still 25, you know, that's what five times a hundred, twelve hundred, six thousand dollars invested back in the jujitsu community that wasn't there before, you know, times that times 40, that's a quarter million dollars a year going back into our schools by fans it's not even that man like it's it's not even that it's it's it changes people's lives you know like it gets people exposed to something like i, I have rules for my kids they have to do jujitsu and it's because i don't think there's something better in the whole entire world for someone than jujitsu and yep. you, you you're exposing people to that and you're exposing to people to to the good side of it not the mma fight side of it you know most most people go to MMA fights and you know they have no interest in ever they're, they're like I'm never going to fucking do this they wanted the, all they want is the entertainment aspect they want to see yeah. somebody die basically you know or come very very close to it where with what you're doing man it's totally different yeah it's, it's fun though too i mean like i'm having a, i'm having a great time like i'm having fun doing it I, you know? I yeah i like going man up until i announced the last fight and i realized i have to tear this shit down for the next 8 hours <laughs> Everything. Like, that's when it hits me. Like right when I announced the last fight and I closed the video wall computer, I'm just like, all right, Fuck. here we go. Now, now, <laughs> now, it's, now it's the work. Yeah, I hate I hate tearing down. I fucking hate it. 63,000 pounds of, of production equipment is what we have right now. Jesus Christ, huh? I talked to, uh, who was it, Brittany Elkins the other day. She said you guys are doing this like new behind the scenes thing, huh? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, especially now that retard broke her arm, there's really not much else she can do. But, um, you know, we have some really cool stuff that's coming out. We, we just signed that new three year contract with flow grappling okay. and, and it, it, it was a huge finance booster and it really, the way that they're doing things for me, um, let's just say once you get in the top seven, I can pay you a lot more than I normally do. So things have changed on the way that they're regarding athletes in regards to the rankings. So when I can take care of pe I can take care of people better and get more big fights. So you're telling, I, me, you're telling me I have to go up one more spot. Just one more. And then, and then I, that's all I need you to do. All right. So I'm going to win there. the trials. So I'm going to win the trials and then I'll be good. Done. All right. And, uh, so, and so the new contract is really good. I, Jared fought really hard for me and we got it done. And, um, you know, so, I'm really happy with where I sit with them right now, and it's going to be a really good three years. And I'm announcing tomorrow that Fight to Win is going to be the first jiu-jitsu company that has betting lines on five fights per card. Fuck yeah. So people are going to be able to gamble on their friends. Uh, now, you, now you're talking. Now you're yeah. talking. Now you're going to well, get some interest. Think about it, dude. I, I, I finally got into sports book. You get into sports book, dude, like that's how – Things get big. You get outside people that have no idea and are just fucking degenerate gamblers and will gamble on anything. Now they're interested in this, and it helps spread it. I'm serious, man. Yeah, I hear you, man. It helps. I hear spread. you. I, you know, people like you know, professional. The reason that professional poker players are all broke, broke is because they go win all the money at the poker table and then they go fucking lose it at the craps. Yeah, I mean, and and this sports book deal that I, that I just hit, I'm not, I'm not making you know, obscene amount on it. I thought I could get paid off the lines, but evidently my lawyer says that's illegal. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you can't match make the event and bet on it yourself. And I was like, why? The lines don't make any sense. I can make a killing. Mm. You, you can't do it. It's like, God damn it. So yeah, Dana White uh, is not allowed to bet on UFC fights, yeah, bro. Yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. But, you know, it's going to be really cool and I'm excited for it. Um, 
you know, to see, to see, just to see how the interest and how the feedback goes, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating some negative stuff, which is more fun to me than the positive. So we're announcing that tomorrow. Um, it's going to be on my Okay. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be cool, man. It's going to be cool. Like I'm hoping that they pick my fight in Denver. Cause I, it's just a cool thing to see people gamble on you. Like uh-huh. that's cool. Uh-huh. I gamble on you. I bet. I remember. I bet ten thousand dollars when you fought Jules Bruchet, <laughs> and I only won eight hundred and seventy-five bucks. Yeah, that was a tough bet for you. I, <laughs> I, you, I was not. You know, I mean, like, I wasn't losing that fight, but nobody made money on that fight. But I it was, was a guarantee. I think I was a minus <laughs> seven hundred or some shit. It was minus eight seventy-five. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, something crazy. And I remember betting. I bet ten grand on that fight, <laughs> and I made eight hundred bucks after it was all said and done. I remember um, I was so pissed at me. I was like, "It's a guarantee." I was like, he cannot lose. It's impossible. It'd be pretty, yeah, that, you know, I, I, I like Jules, but at that point in time, it would have been very hard. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Um, he fought on one of my shows too. But, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. we, we got some new stuff. And then, you know, Brittany's doing a lot of behind the scenes uh, videos and stuff like that. Just, we're just trying to get these fighters as much publicity and attention. And I've got some new sponsors and some of the new sponsors are really wanting to work with the fighters like Leo, Al- uh, Leo optics gives us a pair of sunglasses to give for the submission of the night for purple, brown, black. And then I'm hoping that, you know, those guys post that and they see a following and maybe they get pick up that sponsorship too, you know? So, I mean, like it all works together, you know? So it's just like trying to, trying to keep the platform going We've got um, – we're going international this year too. So that's a big step for me. That's this Hawaii, step. yeah. Hawaii was a big one for me and now that I know I can do it and it was successful. Um, well, I mean we're still going to lose a bunch of money but it's whatever. But it, it's successful in terms of how many tickets we sold. It's sure. going to be the second biggest event we've ever had. And – um, and, it, and this is a tiny fucking place. Like you can get through this whole city or like this like this island in like 45 minutes in a yeah, car. it's tiny. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, – so we're going to go to Tokyo later this year. Oh, fuck. Yeah, that's hot. That, yeah, I've been I've been wanting to do that. And that's one of the main reasons that I've been incorporating judo as well was um, because when I go to these international markets, like when I go to Tokyo or when we go to China, Judo's or, huge, right? Judo's huge in Japan, obviously. It's too small. So why would I want to fill a card with fucking purple belts that barely compete in jujitsu or Japanese jujitsu guys? When I can fill the card half with badass judo motherfuckers yeah. and half with judo black belts, that's so that's kind of where my thought process is with the judo thing. And I, I'm excited because I feel like I'm not. I, I'm Look, not. Man, the best part about it, Seth, is you're just not afraid to fucking fall on your face. You're not afraid to flop. You know, which is everyone's so scared of. Maybe this judo thing ain't gonna work. Who knows? But you're like, fuck it, I'm trying it. Let's go. Yeah, who cares? I mean, that's one of the things too, though. Is like. I, Somebody posted something – when Nick DiPopolo posted that thing about you know, that he wasn't getting paid for judo and all that, like I didn't really care that much to be honest with you because he hasn't won anything. So like I'm like, yeah, I get it. You're an Olympian but like you know, fucking – you don't want anything in like seven years. So why sure. should they be paying you? But at the same point, I was like I know how hard it is to become number one. Uh-huh. Because I never got there. Right. You know, I got to number two. That was as high as I ever got. So I was like – Maybe I should create something for these guys too because those motherfuckers put in just as much work, if not way more than we do. Yeah, and man. It's, it's way harder on their bodies. So let's see what happens. Let's let's give them a chance to go out there, slam each other, and we're going to see some cool new submissions. That's one of the other things with judo that you don't get with jujitsu. You don't get 15-second fucking transitional submissions like this. Right. They are amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, like the way like – those clock chokes and stuff like that, they're just better at it than we are. Yeah. Because they have no time. Everything. They have to. They just go boom. Here, I got to make this happen right now. Got to go. Yeah. And, and so I think we're going to get a lot of exciting stuff from it. You know, I haven't had a ton of people signing up for it. We've got one in Colorado, uh, one in New Mexico. Then we'll have one in um, a some in Dallas. You know, but I think it'll pick up, especially when we go to the the East Coast. And I get if I get Travis Stevens on the card or Jimmy Pedro sure. or like a, a big big name like Kayla. You know, you're just not a, it's cool that you're, you know, people like what you said, you're going to lose a bunch of money on the card, man. Look, when you go into business, you lose money sometimes, right? What's the the worst thing that happens? The worst thing that happens literally in my business, the worst thing that can happen is I lose money because I have insurance. So it's like, if I get sued, I'm covered. So whatever. So the worst thing that happens is I lose money. Dude, I've been fucking bankrupt twice. Sure. You know, when I started this company, I I had $2,000 and now I have millions of dollars of equipment. So, okay. I, 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 the, the company falls flat on its face 
for something for a couple. I know people I can ask for money to help me get back up. Or I'll just fall and hit zero, go get a job at Arby's as a fucking front desk person and then become the vice president in three months. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just like – it doesn't – I'm never worried about taking chances and I'm never worried about taking risks because I know if I lose everything, I can get back to where I need to be. Fuck yeah, man. That's that, that, we're ending right there because if you lose everything, you're, you'll get back. Seth, I appreciate it, man. I think everyone – tell. I mean I'm sure everyone knows where to reach you but tell them where to hit you up. Uh, just hit me up on Facebook or Instagram. It's the easiest way. I probably won't return your messages, but I appreciate the love. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Thanks for the podcast. I hope everyone enjoyed. All right, have a good day. Uh, you're Bye. the man, Seth.